Hi, this is Sean D'Souza, and you're listening to the Three Month Vacation Podcast. This podcast isn't some magic trick about how to work less. Instead, it's about how to really enjoy the work that you do and to enjoy your vacation time. Hi, it's Sean. It's 5 a.m. on a Friday morning, and you're listening to the three month vacation. There's something incredibly fascinating about the way chefs work. A chef doesn't tend to cook for one person. And in one night, one single night, that chef might need to whip up anywhere between 50 to 200 meals. And we're not even necessarily talking about chefs that you see in fancy kitchens. You can walk into any food court, you can go to any roadside stall, and it's the same story. There is flavor, there's taste, there's texture, and there's this huge volume and variety in the food. It got me thinking, what makes the chef so proficient at what she or he does? The answer, strange as it seems, is that they don't tend to worry about how the dish is going to turn out. Their obsession seems to lie in the prep work, the preparation. So let's say... We're going to make you that chef. And let's say you have to make an Indian dal. And dal, if you don't know, is split pulses or legumes. And now what you have to do is you're going to need onions. You're going to need tomatoes. You're going to need chilies, uh, ginger, garlic paste, and about five or six spices. It's at this stage that the professional and the wannabe seems to have plans that are diametrically different. Let's just take the act of chopping onions. How do you chop an onion efficiently? Here's what you do. Step one, you cut the onion from head to toe, not through the belly, but head to toe. And if you follow that first instruction, the peel, the skin comes out way faster than if you went through the belly. So that's two steps. And then the third step is you hold the onion, and this is difficult to say on audio, but you hold the onion and then you chop methodically and evenly but only three-fourths of the way. And finally, you cross-cut the onion and you get chopped onion. Now, that's precise and, and the onion cooks really evenly. But if we were to jump from onion cutting to article writing, we have the same amount of preparation or at least a similar amount of preparation. A wannabe writer will start to look far into the future towards how that article will show up, how it will be written, and that writer might spend hours wondering how to start the article. But this is not what professionals tend to do. Professional writers head right into the zone of prep work. They know that it's the preparation. It's the onions, the tomatoes, the spices. That's the part of the writing that really matters. So they work on getting topics together. Then they realize the topics are too broad, and so they have to go into the subtopic or the sub-subtopics. And when they finish that phase of preparation, they go to the next one, which is outlining. Some scribble outlines in a matter of minutes, and some take more time. They get more explicit with their detail. But all of this is still the preparation stage. But let's say we shift our focus back to the wannabe writer. What is he or she trying to do at this point in time? They're trying to do triple somersaults about what's down the road. They're eager to get past all of this nonsensical planning, this outlining of topics and other blah, blah, blah stuff that comes along the way. So all of this prep work for the wannabe writer is somehow an obstacle. And the sooner they get over it all, the more likely they feel, okay, I will get to the finished work. But a professional will tell you that the end point tends to be the most straightforward bit. All of the energy goes into the prep work. And this brings us to a very critical point. All of this prep work, it's truly exhausting. 
Writing an outline can take anywhere between 30 to 40 minutes. That's on top of the time that you take for the subtopics and the topics and all of that idea generation. And that's not counting the story that you're going to need for the first 50 words to start up your article. All of this prep work is truly frustrating at the best of times, which is why the pros always focus on reducing the energy needed for the prep work. What this means is that prep work, cutting onions, doing all that stuff, it takes an enormous amount of time. So if it takes you 20 minutes to cut an onion, and now you can get it down to 10 minutes, or you can get it down to five minutes, or get it down to three minutes, now what you've done is reduce the amount of energy that's needed to do the prep work. And that is phenomenal. So someone writing an outline will go from 60 minutes to 30 minutes, from 30 minutes to 20 minutes, from 20 to 10, and possibly even just a few minutes. I just tend to whip out a Evernote file and just make some notes, or I'll just write something on my iPad, or I'll have a post-it. The point is, now I can do that in a few minutes, and it's all prep work. But also notice the subtle message here, which is the energy required for the prep work needs to come down. Because when you work on getting stunningly fast at the preparation stages, the end product almost takes care of itself. If you want to find someone who struggles with their writing, who struggles with their drawing, their cooking, or just about any skill, look at what they're doing in the preparatory stages. They're slow. They're inefficient. They may still turn out a great product. There is no doubt about that. But it's mind-numbingly energy-dependent. And by the time they're done with their project, they have to rest. They have to take long breaks. And they dread starting up another project of a similar nature. I was that person. If you look at my drawing today, you'll think that I always drew this way. I was always good at cartooning. And the thing with cartoons is that it leaves a trail. You can go back in time and see the cartoons that I've done. And even if you don't consider yourself much of a critic, you'll see giant strides all of a sudden. So if you go back to the year 2000, I was already a good cartoonist. But if you look at the work today, it's remarkably superior. And one of the obvious thoughts that come to our head is, well, this is all practice. You practice, you practice, you get better. But you fail to see the prep work. Because when I look at my work today, I put in more prep work than ever before. So if you look at the photos album in my iPad, there are over 800 images there, just like ingredients, just images of different things. And that's one stage of the prep work. When I'm drawing, I'll have sketches. Several of them will be stages in progress, and they'll all be waiting to see the light of day. And then I'll run some of these ideas past my wife, Renuka, and, you know, she'll say, oh, that's horrible. And I'll keep it aside and, and it'll sit there sometimes for weeks. And then one day that same idea shows up in a different way. So all of this is prep work. And all the time I'm trying to make this system, all of this prep work more efficient. Yet when I look at other artists, what they tend to do is, okay, I have to draw and I'm going to draw right now. And that's where the trouble begins. Now, I've been talking about drawing, but it applies to anything. It applies to cooking as well. So I cook a new dish for every meal. And unlike in the past, our fridge never seems to have leftovers because we cook and then we eat. The process of the prep work has become so energy efficient that having stale and reheated food makes no sense at all. If I do the prep work, then the cooking part, that's five to seven minutes. So we're going to have fresh meals all the time. And it's taken years to understand what makes some people so incredibly productive. And if we're paying attention, you and I, we'll both come to the same conclusion. It's an unmistakable conclusion. The prep work needs to be ruthlessly efficient. It's not just prep work, but it needs to be efficient. And if we go back to the article writing course, 
In the article writing course, the client has to learn about topics, subtopics, outlines, first 50 words. And yes, as a teacher, I'm looking at the assignment every day, sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, several times a day. But here's the thing that I look for the most. I look at the daily log of the participants. I want them to note down how long they took to do the assignment. I want to see how much time they spent on learning. I am more interested in their state of mind, in the time they take, what they are dreading. That's the kind of stuff that I'm interested in. All of this information is in the daily log that they are supposed to do when they given their assignment. And it paints the detail of the prep work. It paints how efficient they are at the prep work. This isn't to suggest that the end isn't important. Having a goal, even a hazy idea of where you're headed, that's definitely the way to go. However, it's very easy to place all your attention on the end point and forget that it's the tiny components, that it's the prep work. That's what makes the journey more fun instead of this dread and this drudgery. To finish, let me tell you a story about John Wooden. You may have never heard of John Wooden, but he was a coach and an excellent basketball coach. In the space of 12 seasons, he won 10 championships with UCLA, and that put him in an orbit all by itself. But Wooden had a very strange way of starting his coaching system. At the start of every season, he taught every basketball player to tie their shoelaces. Shoelaces? Surely there were better things to learn than tying shoelaces. But Wooden did it every year. And he had a reason why he went through this seemingly mindless routine. Badly tied laces lead to blisters, he would say. And well-tied laces means that you don't easily get sprained ankles. You notice something? Wooden wasn't focused on the final score. Yes, the final score mattered, but he wasn't focused on it. Instead... It was the prep work that mattered. When you take care of the prep work and you become incredibly speedy at it, extremely efficient at it, you use up so little energy. And when you use up little energy, then you can go on to the main body of work that you've been looking for, and then you have the energy for that. So it's the prep work and reducing that amount of time that's important. Now that brings us to the end of this podcast. And if you noticed, there were no three parts here. There was just one part. And it was just an in-between, as I like to call it. And there's not a lot to summarize. But if you can look at your prep work, like cutting an onion, and you can say, well, it takes me 10 minutes to do that. I'll get it down to 8 and 7 and 6. All of that makes all the difference when you're writing, when you're drawing, when you're trying to learn any skill. If you can reduce the amount of prep work time, that's the most crucial thing of all. So that brings us to the end of this podcast. Let's find out what's happening in Psychotactics land. There are a couple of home studies that are coming out in the next couple of months. So on the 23rd of September, we have the Uniqueness Home Study. And as I promised, there would be a podcast. But there are other podcasts on uniqueness in this series. So go looking for them. There are over 200 podcasts now. So go looking for the uniqueness ones. And I can't remember whether I mentioned, but there is a brand new website. So everything looks really nice on the website. Uh, loads and loads of cartoons. I think you'll enjoy it. I know people say, oh, go to my website. Go to this website. I think you'll enjoy it a lot. But to go back to the uniqueness thing, there are goodies. It's at psychotactics.com slash you goodies. So that's you as in the U, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. We say Z. So you goodies. So psychotactics.com slash you goodies. And then on the 13th of October, there's the home study of the article writing course, which a lot of you are waiting expectantly for. And yes, it'll be there on the 13th of October. 
clients often ask me what product should they buy you know just out of the blue out of the sequence kind of thing and one of the things that is very useful is this series on presentations now you may think i don't do presentations but what it does is it shows you how to construct your communication so that if you're talking to a group of people if you're doing a webinar if you're doing a seminar if you're doing anything where you're trying to get a message across this presentation series makes a huge difference just amazing difference and you can find out more about it at psychotactics.com slash presentation and join us in 5000 bc you know because yes we have lots of information but information itself is very debilitating and you need to bounce your ideas off a group that's very supportive and very knowledgeable. I also use 5000 BC for doing my own stuff. Like, for instance, I'm now writing the notes for the sales page course. And I should have finished it in August. But, well, I no. Wait, I should have finished it in July, but now it's August. So the Taking Action Forum, that keeps me on track in 5000 BC. And join us in 5000 BC. It's a great place to be. And that brings us to the end of this podcast. Thank you for listening. Bye for now. Are you still listening? Well, here's one of the things that happens right after we finish off some sales. So we just finished the info products. And as you probably know, there are only 35 copies, even if it's a digital product. And almost on cue, after we finish the sale, someone will come to us and go, oh, I was away, or I just saw this, or, you know, isn't there a way that I could get it? It's only digital. And, you know, it's $1,500. So if you just said yes to one, two, or three of them, that's $5,000 that you make and technically nobody has to know about it. But if you were to write to Renuka me, you'd get the same response. And that is that we're not going to have this double standard. And I think this is a lesson for all of us that we get tested all the time. We say one thing and then we get tested on it. And then we have to stand up to what our ethics are. And ethics aren't something that, you know, have like a defining line on the ground. In fact, I used to tell Marsha that ethics are what you do when no one is looking. And really, that's what Shakespeare said as well. He said, be true to yourself and you can't be wrong to anybody else. So obviously, I can't preach and tell you what you should do. But what we do is we send out a consistent message that we can't have this double standard, that we're going to stick by what we think is true. And they'll just have to wait for the next time. And I have another funny story, but we'll leave that for another time. Bye for now.